head-turning, and all-knowing. Joan Holloway is one of the most subversive characters in Matthew Weiner's Mad Men. Her complicated journey from head secretary to executive exposes some of the most horrifying sexism of the 60s and arrives at a place that's surprisingly modern. We won't answer to anyone. It'll be something of ours with our name on it. Unlike other female characters on the show whose ambition or dedication to domesticity come first, Joan initially seems torn between these two paths. The unexpectedness of her character arc and how much her evolution surprises even herself is what makes Joan so compelling. Because it's better than being screwed by you. Desired by all, Joan's a kind of 1960s Venus, who's used to attracting attention for her curvaceous body, red hair, and dull face. My mother raised me to be admired. She's routinely compared to other historical sex symbols. First, there's the obvious physical comparison to Marilyn Monroe. Jackie? Marilyn? Well, Marilyn's really a Joan, not the other way around. Joan's devastated response to Marilyn's death is telling. Hey, you're not like her. Physically a little, but don't tell me that makes you sad. It's not a joke. This world destroyed her. It reveals that sexualized women of the time were thought to be headed for a tragedy. Show creator Weiner has said that Joan is like Helen of Troy, in that men like Jaguar executive Herb Rennett will go to great lengths to sleep with her. And Pete tries to persuade Joan to sleep with Herb by likening her to another beautiful, lusted after woman. Do you consider Cleopatra a prostitute? Where do you get this stuff? Joan's reputation as a Venus isn't just in her world. Audiences and media reactions to the character largely focused on the same. Frequent shots of Joan walking towards or away from us encourage us to notice her Rubenesque figure, letting us see her as men do. So we too are making this journey over the course of the show of coming to see her as more than a sex symbol. I didn't know you were such a reader. It's part of my job. I thought you just walked around with people staring at you. A contradictory character through and through, Joan both upholds and disproves sexist conventions of her time. On the one hand, there's what she says and expects from life. Let's look for some actual bachelors. Empty their wallets. And on the other, there's what she does and where her life ends up. At the beginning of the show, she hopes to get married and leave her job as office manager. Of course, if you really make the right moves, you'll be out in the country and you won't be going to work at all. To outsiders, Joan's engagement to handsome surgeon Greg seems perfect, but as viewers, we see that their relationship is a sham. His insecurities poison their interactions. He refuses even to let Joan be on top during sex. You're tired. Let me do the driving. It's okay. Tony. Tony, Tony, stop. Greg rapes Joan in Don's office, and her decision to marry him in spite of this shows how far she's willing to go to achieve that heteronormative ideal. I don't want to miss our reservation. No, of course not. Joan's disillusionment with marriage proves that this conventional life is a lie. Greg is emotionally immature and paternalistic, and the baby they have together was actually conceived by Roger. I'm glad the army makes you feel like a man, because I'm sick of trying to do it. Although Greg and Joan are incompatible, each is strongly shaped by societal expectations of their respective genders. Even if there haven't been other women, he's not used to listening to a woman. Both suffer for it. Greg is scarred by his failure to achieve masculine success as a doctor and a lover. And the expectation that Joan will be a housewife is also exposed as nonsensical. Why don't you just not show up? I'll lose my job. We'll make it. Until when? Greg is incapable of being a breadwinner, and Joan misses her work. In spite of these disappointments, Joan not only pretends to have a happy marriage, but even continues to encourage others to believe in this false narrative of marital joy based on typical gender roles. And Joan is still, you know, supporting that mythology to other people, even though it hasn't happened for her. Joan's commitment to the happy marriage myth shows how deeply she's been shaped by social beliefs of her time. And one of the reasons it's so fascinating to watch is that as modern viewers, we can actually relate more than we might expect. 
The masculine and feminine ideals Greg and Joan struggle to live up to aren't so outdated as we'd like to think. And that frustrated feeling of inadequacy that can come with not being respected by peers as a real man or a real woman is still very commonly felt. Joan is especially vulnerable to these feminine expectations because her self-image comes from how others see her. Given how much validation she's gotten for her looks and how little for other aspects of her personality, it makes sense that she places such importance on finding a man, and that she's stuck in this mindset even though she knows on some level that it's hollow. If he's going to end it, which I doubt, you'll know what to do. If he's going to propose, you better have your answer prepared. Especially if it's no. We might even read some subtle cues into her name. Holloway sounds like hollow way, perhaps alluding to the superficial drive to marry well, which isn't serving her, while Joan evokes the independent Joan of Arc, perhaps a nod to her true nature as a self-reliant individual. They'll drag you into the garbage out there. They just want you to be as miserable as they are. I say let them have it. Yeah, while most notice her body first, Joan's intelligence is almost as quickly conveyed to us. Bordering on cynical, Joan knows exactly what others are thinking about her, as well as what they're plotting in general. Apart from her one big delusion about Mr. Wright, what we might call her blind spot, her eyes are unclouded by naivete or wanting to see the best in people. She knows the bottom lines and understands the world she's living in far more accurately than almost any other character. Joan displays great aptitude for working within the sexist parameters of the time to get ahead. Like Peggy, she overcomes the obstacles to female success in the workplace. But the two take opposite approaches to their femininity. You want to be taken seriously? Stop dressing like a little girl. Weiner has said that Peggy's weight gain in the first season is a response to feeling sexualized by men in the office. In contrast, Joan would never consider trying to unsex herself or appear more masculine. She wears form-fitting clothes that enhance rather than hide her body, and she's resourceful about using her sexuality as a currency. Although she does find the prospect of sleeping with Herb repulsive, she agrees because it's the only way for her to reach the professional level of partner. It is a lot of money, Lane. It's four times what I make in a year. The quality of her work is irrelevant in this work environment, as we see in season two when her beloved script reading job is given to a man. He's going to be in charge of broadcast operations. Excuse me? I've really appreciated you filling in. I couldn't have asked for more. Joan knows everything about this. Well, that makes one of us. Joan's pragmatism and acceptance can sometimes backfire on her, though. Well, no matter how powerful we get around here, they can still just draw a cartoon. And her skill at realistically navigating the system can't protect her from still being exploited and feeling humiliated. What do you do around here besides walking around like you're trying to get raped? Excuse me? I'm not some young girl off the bus. I don't need some madam from a Shanghai whorehouse to show me the ropes. Businessmen from other offices also refuse to take Joan seriously, subjecting her to endless sexual harassment and innuendo. You should be in the bra business. Your work of art. Men often act like Joan is distracting in a business context, when they're the ones unwilling to focus on the business at hand. Though she doesn't let others see it, the weight of the patriarchy takes a big toll on her. I am not your darling, and I don't want your kisses. What? I thought American men were bad enough, but none of them has ever so consistently made me feel like a helpless, stupid little girl. Even her romantic partners can't comprehend how Joan could be equally committed to her work and to a relationship. You act like this is happening to you, but you're making a choice. I can't just turn off that part of myself. I would never dream of making you choose. In many ways, Joan is Don's feminine counterpart. She's similarly carnal, confident, desirable, and shrewd. But these qualities don't always work for her as they do for Don. Joan's decision to sleep with Herb in exchange for the agency partnership is viewed unfavorably. You know what? I'm sorry my accomplishments happened in broad daylight, and I can't be given the same rewards. But Don's sexual impropriety within the office is rarely held against him, and his sexual encounters can also have a transactional nature to them, as when he asks Dr. Fay for the names of dissatisfied clients he can poach. It's significant that Don never pursues Joan romantically, because apart from Peggy, who's like a daughter protege to him, he has at least some sexual or flirtatious interaction with almost every other young attractive woman we meet. But Joan and Don feel almost like siblings or male and female equivalents. 
But no flowers from you. You scared the shit out of me. Burp. Two alike somehow, like they see through each other. When Don gets upset about Joan sleeping with Herb, his reaction comes off like the protective brother defending his relation's virtue. I wanted to tell you it's not worth it. And if we don't get Jaguar, so what? Yet Weiner has suggested the deeper reason for Don's reaction is a subconscious rivalry or competitiveness. Her action invalidates the importance of his advertising pitch, and in this case, Joan's desirability trumps his, which is a feeling he's not really used to. He wants to win it. He doesn't need any help. It's hard for people to understand that, but the man has a really big ego. And there's another very significant way in which the show leaves Joan in a similar position to Dawn, her ultimate relationship status. Out of the major female characters on Mad Men, Joan is the only one who's not in a relationship at the end of the show. But it seems to me your life is undeveloped property. You can turn it into anything you want. It's got a hell of a view. She's grown into an independent, self-assured single mother and business owner. Her decision to name her company using her maiden and married last names instead of searching for a partner. Holloway Harris, how may I help you? Reflects an acceptance of her full self. She's no longer trying to satisfy gendered sure. expectations that don't serve her. Finally, she is her own boss. The irony is that the Joan we first met was not trying to end up here and would not have wanted this life. All partners present? Aye. Aye. Rather than fulfilling the feminine ideals she's been chasing, she's actually succeeded more by the masculine standards of her time. Yet she's achieved far greater success than it occurred to her to dream of. And she outgrew not just our expectations, but her own. I want love. And I'd rather die hoping that happens than make some arrangement.